Okay, everyone, welcome to Star Trek Trek Trek, our ongoing journey through the a litany of episodes that represent the entirety of Star Trek. This week, we've taken a diversion in lieu of our wonderful guest that has joined us this week. He cannot show his face yet, has the wit of the gods, our wonderful chatter over tired to below me. Thank you for joining us. And obviously, also Star Series. Yes. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh... We have just finished. What? <laughs> Sorry, God. <laughs> no, no, nothing. No. Uh, we have just finished watching uh, peak performance, and now here we are to review it. This episode. So, as I mentioned before, we, I have gone through a little bit of culture shock because we've gone pretty much from watching a lot of early season one TNG to now watching this, and I'm just like, this. This was good. This was fun. <laughs> Well, don't spoil your final rating. I will. I will not. I will not. So this episode was written by. Oh no! Yeah, no. This episode was written by David Kemper, who also wrote the the enemy. Good episode. I like the enemy. Mm. That's a nice one. And time and again. Was time and again? Okay, so <laughs> we reviewed time and again. Go go watch that review. Don't watch the episode, but watch I don't the know if review. We, did we do a Star Trek Trek Trek, or did we just do it in a timeline? Yes, talk? we did, did we? and oh. we crapped on it like relentlessly. It was so bad. The story points were so... Th the plot was non-existent. Everyone was terrible in it. And we called him out by name. We're like, David Kemper, don't, you know, don't forget that name. And then he shows up with one of the tightest scripts. Like, this script is so good. It, it you know, whatever. Go well, <laughs> some of that can go towards the directing. It was directed by Robert Shearer, who also directed A Measure of a Man, classic, The Defector, The Chain of Command Part 1, Shadow Play, and Voyager's State of Flux. So, you know, a, a fair a fair amount of good uh, credits there. But first off, round the table, uh, Overtide, what do you think of the episode? Uh, I loved it. It's, uh, it's like you said, it uh, really steps it up from season one, and it's it you know it makes probably some of the best tng use of the ferengi um keeps them mildly threatening but it does clown on them a little bit but uh no i yeah, uh... i i think they kind of clown on themselves though to be fair <laughs> i mean yeah that's fair they kind of well, turn the up and they stand around going <laughs> they turn up and go what's going on here we're claiming all this us. Yes, yeah, so we're claiming all this is salvage. Like they sort of turn up and just go like, "This is our business now," and then they get fe they get fooled by Worf's extreme hacking skills. Like this was this was saved by Worf being the, like the techno nerd he really is. He can't build a ship in a bottle, but he can build he can build illusions in space. Look, I don't know, man. You just have to realize that Worf is just built different. I don't know. I think that's the problem with you. <laughs> is you don't realize his uh, innate skill at getting past crypto security like lockdown. Mm. Okay, I want to. I prepared some thoughts, and I think this. What have we done? Like forty-five track tracks. I've never written down thoughts ahead of time, but wow. I was thinking about this episode this week. I'm like, you know, this is such a good episode. I want to. I have some things I want to say. And since Dan's not here, he has bird flu this week. This is an episode that I know he he would love. He does love because <clears throat> we've lamented in the past, like, uh, you know, unprofessional behavior on starships. Or, uh, you know, hopelessness instead of optimism and, and effort and all that kind of stuff. All right. There are um, there are quintessential episodes, right? If you think of what's the, the quintessential date episode, you might think Measure of a Man. Quintessential Geordi might be like Booby Trap, where you see some of his problem-solving skills and also his skills with women. Like, that's a good microcosm of Geordi. This is the quintessential Starfleet episode. Like, if someone said, you know, I've got 42 minutes... Uh, what's what's Starfleet all about? Why is that in the center of all the shows? Why do, why do people in universe want to go to the Academy and join Starfleet? This is why. Exhibit A. Challenge. Exhibit this, is, this is, yeah, I've got it all. Yeah, this pros and cons, what's going on? <laughs> well, you know, you wouldn't let me join the, the, the pros and cons <laughs> of the charity stream, so I'm making my own. All right, Exhibit A, Challenge. Uh, the script is all about challenges. The whole episode, you know, we start with war games. Um they at the at the top they make it clear that's not starfleet's primary goal they throw in a plausible threat with the borg we get a little bit of serialization all right the challenge against each other and we get picard versus Riker, which i think is a smart choice they could have just had some schmucks show up from starfleet command and be like all right we're ship a you're ship b 
but it, they make it more personal with Picard versus Riker, which I think is smart. Iron sharpens iron. We get Riker versus Kolrami. He challenges him knowing he's going to lose just for the fun of it. We get Data and Kolrami. Challenges him twice, in fact. That's a whole storyline unto itself. Uh, and they even talk about challenge in the dialogue. Data says, I'm forever curious, this urge to compete. Pulaski says, it's a human response. The inborn craving to gauge your capabilities through conflict. Uh, one of my my favorite, well, it's two well, scenes don't early forget on. forget that the Zach Dorn word for mismatches challenge. Challenge, that's right, yeah. Which, by the way, I'll take a detour to say, uh, whoever the, you might know, you might have memory off of pulled up, whoever plays the Zach Dorn here is so good. This is top shelf minor character acting he's got all the little mannerisms down he winks he hisses like everything you could possibly think of as an actor to make yourself stand out this guy does so ray that's great. brocksmith ray brocksmith who was also in uh another episode of star trek as razna khan in DS9, yeah. in ds9 episode he's a bajoran uh indiscretion so yeah he has he does come back uh so uh, on the theme of challenge I love how Riker recruits his staff. He doesn't he doesn't say, all right, you're with me, you're on the ship. He doesn't do that. And he doesn't give him a speech, you know, like, we, we have to do this to try to test ourselves, to better ourselves. He just goes to Geordi and he presents a challenge. He says, you know, the engines are touchy and archaic. It's going to be a hard thing. And Geordi's right on board. He's like, well, I've already got something prepared. All right, let's go. Then he goes to Worf and he says, we're outmanned, we're outgunned. There's no hope. And does Worf back down? No, of course not. He's like, you know, guile. I love that that line too. He's ready to go. These guys, professional Starfleet officers, are up to the challenge, and they illustrate that instead of getting like like a preachy scripted kind of sequence there. Um, exhibit B, competency. Uh, Idol, you've been going through WWF old school wrestling stuff recently. The biggest trope in wrestling is the good guy, the babyface, has to be a complete idiot in order for the bad guy, the heel, to get one up on him, right? Because if the bad guy gets gets one over on the good guys, then you feel sympathy for him, you're going to root for him, right? Except the side effect is then your good guy looks like a complete moron, and they don't do this here. There's there's two chance or two times where the Enterprise crew gets gets on the back foot. Once when Data loses to Kohlrabi. And once when Picard's call with his pants down. Now, those are those are understandable, believable moments. Uh, Data, his thinking is robotic. And he, he rectifies that later in the episode by learning to think more, you know, like a human, more innovative, more creative. And Picard and the Enterprise were just tricked by the Hathaway with the fake Romulan bird of prey. So that's understandable that, that he would not buy a second illusion. So no one's being dumb here. They're being smart. And the bad guys take advantage of that little moment of weakness, which I think is very smart. Um, exhibit C, camaraderie and supportiveness. This is also a big tenant of Starfleet. I think it's what a lot of people like uh, in relation to optimism and, and hopefulness. We've come along, this is season end of season two. It's a long way from Encounter at Farpoint where Picard is testing Riker with like basic stuff like manual docking or whatever. Um, and I thought, I was thinking today, when we watched through Corbomite Maneuver, one of the things, Stars, you liked is you believed right from the outset that when Kirk said, no, Spock, I need you I need you here in control of the ship. You're my number one. I trust you. You buy that right away. And this is the same kind of dynamic where Picard picks Riker. He chooses him as his opponent. He, he lets him pick his own crew, too, because he trusts everything that he does. So I love that dynamic. A wharf throws in behind Riker, of course. You know, he would stand back to back in the trenches with Riker. Riker nominating Wesley, which we kind of chuckled at. That That's good. A, to teach him. B, he's shown, Wesley's shown that he's actually competent through two seasons um, of Star Trek. Troy and Pulaski, they don't get a ton, but when Data is down in the dumps in his quarters, they come in and they try to buck him up. And then Picard does afterwards, too. Everyone is there to support each other. And no one feels left behind in this episode. Like, everyone is treated as essential, which I really like. So, yeah, as a microcosm of Starfleet, the script, I think, is really tight. It hits all the right notes in terms of why would you want to root for these guys, you know, in in, in the vastness of space? Why are they the good guys in this? And I think that really all shines through. Yeah, I definitely think that... Um, <clears throat> because there's always that question when you want to get someone to Star Trek, okay, where do I start? Right, and it's like 
do you start them off in season one and do you let them just suffer and slug through season <laughs> one? Uh, do you start them off at season three and then say you can go back later if you want, if you can, if you get into the vibe? And it's like, I feel like there's a nice in between solution, which is just episodes like this, um, where it's not as you just say just a microcosm of why you should care about Starfleet, although it does a great job of showing that. It's also just incredibly charming. Um, if you think about those early episodes of TNG, they are so gormless and they are so dull. And there is so much time and effort spent on nothing at all that doesn't go anywhere. Whereas, like, everything here has a purpose and it goes toward a wider hole. And that wider hole is just making you care about these characters. If I didn't know anything about these characters, I would come away from this episode with a very strong impression of what everyone is about and why they do the things they do. And I get an idea of where their story arcs are going. You definitely like, get you know, like, a better impression be, of early yeah. season Worf because, like, his character doesn't develop till much later. But this definitely gives him a better impression that just, oh, you're not Tasha, you know, like you're just like the token Klingon or something like that. Like he doesn't. He comes up his introduction scene where he's trying to build a Klingon ship and he turns around to Riker and just goes, "Guile!" Like he's like, "Oh, this guy has some hidden depths." Like that's quite cool. Well, yeah, it's also you're leaning into like the the humor of it. It's like. It's not afraid to have fun, but it straddles that line of not being farcical, which can often happen in like season one. I feel like they they try and hit that humor button and it just hits that wrong note. But here, everyone's just like kind of effortlessly charming. No one is grating. Um, even though we like actually took a little pot shot here or there, like uh, supporting actors who had like with a weird line read or whatever. Everyone is just clearly having fun. <laughs> like there is just a a vibe of a, a, it's just good vibes. It's like I'm not here for guess what you always want like a good bit of strong drama you know like you always want like, something you know, you know deep and dark and a bit traumatic and that you can grow from but this is just 45 minutes of face hijinks in a way but really constructive and like building hijinks this is the kind of adventure i would want to have if i was in starfleet in star trek you know it's like i don't want this to be every episode but like this is it's, it's sort of a similar um, thing that's going on with like you know, new season Doctor Who, where it's like you need to give uh, the audience a reason to care about these characters, and also make you believe that these characters would want to be here. Because if Starfleet is nothing but non-stop suffering, and everyone is grim and unhappy with each other, and everyone is just like kind of a miserable asshole, guess what? I don't buy that these people would be on a ship working together for twenty-four hours, seven days a week. You say that for DS9. They, like said, well, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that, but that works really hard to get that um, those dynamics. There's very little that's built into DS9, whereas TAG, you kind of come into that. Um, but it's just a case of like, yeah, if you wanted to sit someone down and say, this is your first episode of Star Trek, you know, this is early season, you don't have to know anything, and you showed them this, I think this is like a, a perfect microcosm of why you should care about Star Trek. Yeah, would this work... I, you might need to retool a little bit. This could be a pilot because everyone gets yeah. something. You yeah. buy into them as good guys. They have multiple villains. So like there's a little bit of action. They have humor. They have almost everything you want. There's no, I guess there's no big emotional climax, but outside of that, they give you pretty much everything. You want to root for these guys. Could this you work as a have, pilot? I think you could because like there's even I, a good bit of world building with like the, the, the hint, if you don't know about the Borg, then that's an interesting, ooh, what what's this all about? The, the bits about Starfleet not being a a military organization, it's about a peacekeeping armada, that's a yeah. mission statement right there in itself. And it's so much more efficient than the constant posturing that like, we are a better race mm. in Encounter at Farpoint. I, I, and you I, even I... have stuff like the the um, the Zakdorn, like you know, with the Kolrami, where it's like, you don't get that in Star mm. Trek all that often. You don't get an ob alien observer who is in a position of power in Starfleet and the Federation to come in and talk to the humans on an even keel and be respected as part of the group, but not the same. You know, it's like that in itself is kind of unique. I kind of disagree about the pilot thing. I feel like this works better because we know the cast. I think it works in favour mm. of the fact that if this was a load of unknowns, I think although we get these brief introductions, we don't feel quite as rooted. I think the fact that we know Riker is this bit of a maverick, we know Worf, like giving Worf a comedy scene works every time because we know how much of a, a stuck up Klingon he is, like that, that works so well and Data having the moral quandary is 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 better with the history of his character. Uh, I feel like as a pilot you need 
you just need that time to get to know them but this is the relief that breaks it all down to say like i, I love the i love this episode because it is a nice sort of light-hearted relief that these characters and the audience desperately need um over time your uh, thoughts well hold on sorry I, we're talking over I, you <laughs> yeah we are destroying them right now but i'm gonna disagree with your disagreement because you you mentioned three things one, you know, we know Riker's a maverick. Well, they say in storyline, he's inappropriately jovial. Why would anyone follow him? Mm. And then they show that because they trust and they, you know, they throw in behind him. Um, uh, what else you say? The the minor characters. Well, we had like three new characters in this. We get Glenn Morshower, we get the uh, Cole Rami, and we get this other lady. So they actually had a lot of characters that mm. you wouldn't know, even if it wasn't a pilot. I forget. There's another one that I disagree with, but you know. <laughs> It, well, I disagree it's all with your disagreement anyway. of my disagreement. Yes. Anyway, go on, <laughs> on over time. What you got? <laughs> well, as far as like the could it work as a pilot, I think I don't you wouldn't want it to be a full two part episode. I think you'd want a little more time to flesh the people out just a little bit more. Um, I think a double episode could make it overly long, but I, I could see where you're both coming from on that. Um, about like the the premise itself, it's kind of nice because like it's kind of almost a Starfleet team building exercise that we're watching. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they have this thing to do, but like, it's not like we got to cure this disease or transport these colonists or something. It's like here, we're going to do war games and we say we don't do this a lot. So they're kind of like, it's a game. So, you know, it's you, and then it, it does turn more serious as it progresses of like, and they all take it seriously of like, we want to win this and we, we, know why we're doing this and we want to do well at it but i think everyone, so everyone, everyone in the crew has got a, a shot to prove that everyone that went on the hathaway has got you know they, they're looking at their careers in in the starfleet in the long term they're saying like if we could do really well if we could turn this bucket of bolts into a serious warship against the enterprise the flagship of the fleet like that looks good for us as well especially Riker. Riker takes seriously geordie takes it seriously and you know everyone is there to sort of put their all in like not just for oh we're doing war games but like oh no we're, we're, we're investing in our career here this will be noted right hmm. what did you guys think of the pacing because <clears throat> i think idol said while we were watching <laughs> quote like nothing's happened until minute 35 i, I said that it was I didn't it was that. a lot of preparation and build yeah. up so we don't get the actual ship battle the submarine battle which by the way they threw in a bunch of fantastic the kuma maneuver and like you know and and head to 313 mark 475 minimal aspect full spread of photon like they give you all the trek yeah. babble you want but it doesn't come to later in the episode so what did, what did you guys think of the pacing did that work for you or was there too much build uh, i think they they got it right um it's it's a uh, well like you said like you don't realize how much time has passed even though like it's just putting yeah. the pieces on the board and it you know it's, it's like playing the game mousetrap it's like i want to put the thing together more than play the game i think that, that's actually kind of true because it's a case of you, you you're going through it and you're like you know five ten fifteen minutes it's like yeah nothing has happened but i'm invested in these characters and i feel like i would like in, be invested regardless if this was a pilot or if it was you know, if it is in season two like I want to know where all of these little storylines go. Like, just because there are no quote unquote stakes, like, you know, we talked like uh, one of the biggest problems that Discovery has is that it feels to need to constantly up itself in stakes, right? Meanwhile, here, the stakes couldn't be lower for, for the majority of the episode. The stakes are <laughs> like, oh no, my ego got bruised, or oh Wesley's no, my science didn't... project. Yeah, that's the Oh thing. no. Yeah, no, and it's like. I think yeah. But, but that I think means in you this can case, just sit back and enjoy yourself. Y you can, and then they tried to put in stakes with the Ferengi, and they didn't feel real. That that's kind of my my point one percent of a loss on this episode is like they put the Ferengi in there, and they kind of kind of doing a, th a like a little loose. Oh, we're just here because they hadn't defined the Ferengi at this point, and they were just like, oh, we're here for the salvage of the Hathaway, and it must be an important warship and things like that. And it felt like I would rather have had the drama be in the. The, the war battle maybe something got a bit serious or something got like uh maybe Riker's trying his hardest to win and the, the emotional complex emotional complexes with him not winning or something like that but i felt like the fringy coming in and being just sort of this art almost artificial threat point in in the episode kind of that, nah. that's that's the bit that spoiled it for me a little bit no nah, i completely disagree um 
the, okay. the entire I disagree point with your disagreement. <laughs> yeah. the, the entire point of the episode is that there, while there may be a degree of ego going on, Riker displays very early that he is able to take a loss with like with grace. Mm. Oh yeah, that's yeah, the that's entire great. point of that in that mm. change between him and Korami. It's to show that he can take it without grace. So if you have this entire forty-five minute stretch dedicated to just the war games, then guess what? There is no emotional catharsis. There is no climax mm. because oh no, we lost. No, I think no, 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 that's no. not. I think that's but, more. Like, I suppose have, more that the Frankie come in, come in at like literally five minutes towards the end of the episode and go ha ha with the bad guys and they were like. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is that they, mm. they give it an emotional stake, but they give it that five minutes because it's a case of the Enterprise is not really in danger here. It's the Hathaway and the 40 mm. people on board that are considered to be the tactical losses. And it all feeds back into the wider theme of Starfleet as peacekeeping versus a military organization and the necessity of command decisions. It all feeds back into the same theme. You know what? The fact that it's the Frangius is kind of like, incidentally, it could have been anyone. It could have been the Romans, it could have been the Klingons. But the Could fact have been that they the went board. for Frankie shows that it's lower. If the well, board turned right, up, so that would have ruined. No. That, no. That's <laughs> what I want to ask you guys. A mini yeah. lightning round. We'll start with Overtired. If you could swap out the Frangi for another race, would you and which one? I wouldn't, but I think if you had to, you'd have to do it with the Packlids. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. Because I don't think. Yeah, you I can, can see that. Actually, that would work the Ferengi out. or the Romulans being fooled by that. You know, you would mm. need to be something like that. Or maybe you could get away with something inscrutable like the Breen, but you know they are not till later. <laughs> Stars, what about you? Uh, I I feel like the Ferengi perfectly suit the tone of this is going for. It's not meant to be a life or death situation, really. It's meant to be a case of how do we prove that all these war games actually mattered and that we you know, rose to make the occasion. Because it's all very well doing unsimulated conditions. What happens when you have to put your money where your mouth is? But you don't want, like, guess what? If you had the ball turn up, that would completely ruin the episode. You're probably be the right. worst decision yeah. I could possibly imagine. You can't do the Klingons because it doesn't fit in with the TNG. Romulans, again, that makes no sense. So it has to be the Fringi. The, the Packlers is a good shout. I felt that was a decent one, but I think the Fringi are perfectly fine here because we've established it earlier on TNG. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'd probably go, I, I, actually, I actually would go with the Klingons. I think having a Klingon commander come in for this war game exercise and just interfere and just put them, especially someone from the House of Duras, if they're against the current sort of like Federation yeah. Alliance thing, they'd come in and be like, what is this you are doing against each other? And then kind of like, almost like, you know, the Klingons in Unexpected from Enterprise come in like, we don't know what's going on here. And they're having to be informed of what's happening and what's really going on. I'm like, why would you play pretend games instead of games of actual battle, you know, and, and then try and interfere with the plot that way? I could probably see that working that way. For those keeping score at home, I'm fine with the Ferengi. I think you already had enough humor in this episode, especially with Cole Rami going over the top, that oh that God, didn't so break good. the tone at all. Can we take a minute to talk about Cole Rami of like every little micro expression, every point? Like he was very he that actor put more effort in for this one episode wonder than any other character I've ever seen. Like he he knew the assignment, he took the assignment. And he, no one could stop him. I think there were probably people on the side of stuff like, "Can you just be a little less camp?" And he's like, "No, I'm gonna do this, no. and I'm gonna be fine." <laughs> yeah, he knew he wasn't Hack coming back eggs, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and then you talk. All right, I w I want to talk a little bit about the character building because they did so much of this. You you touched on a little bit earlier, stars Riker. And it really ties into his his season's overarching um, plot of him wanting to stay second in command. His command style is he's a point guard. He dishes it to Worf to handle the tactical stuff. He dishes it to Jordy to handle the ship stuff. Jordy even expresses he's not sure. Maybe it won't work. He's like, Jordy, I have full confidence in you. He even specifically requests Wesley because he knows he's going to help. And Wesley does. He brings value to the mission. And even though he sits there with that shit-eating grin, like, you know, kind of off to the side on the main viewer, he feels like, you know, he's not the man. He's he's the guy in front yeah, of he's, he's the a guys, team you know? Because like, even, even in the view screen, like, you see it, like, it's not just him in the central view screen, it's him and Worf in yeah. the second command. You see the whole crew, essentially, are lined up there. He, he, even, he even takes his, like, view screen uh, assignments seriously as to say, like, this is what we're about. <laughs> 
and not just him war this really could be a pilot i think Worf, you get that he's this big scary low-voiced guy but he's also he's fucking around with like chopsticks or, or toothpicks in his ready room he breaks it he's brings a lot of humor um jordy we see uh, i think sergey said when we're watching it's in character for him to turn down the second in command he's the engines guy he's the scotty that's where he lives you know, obviously we get a ton with Riker. We see Picard, his fuse gets short with Cole Rami, snaps at him, but he, he's in command the whole time. Everybody, I mean, you know, it is a problem that the, that the women officers don't get a ton in this episode. But just as a slice, if you took a slice of this out from Star Trek, you would get a great feel for who all these characters are, I think. There's an alternate universe version where we still have Tasha around, and this is an even better yeah. episode. Yeah, actually, oh, yeah. I would agree. I think this could be a hmm. this, yeah, because if you replaced Burke and gave her some extra characterization, you built up a bit more of a rivalry between her and like Worf. I feel like you would legitimately just like you'd have all points covered. That'd be amazing. I'd hmm. love that. You know what? I'm gonna bring back a Trek Trek classic. Uh, who is your hero of the episode? Ooh, you can go with actor, wow. actor or character. And I'll throw oh. the new guy to the wolves again. Over tired, let's start with you. <laughs> Who is your hero of the episode? Um, I would say um, the uh, Korami. Um, oh, damn. He's... <laughs> That's going to be mine. Oh, we can share. <laughs> share is fine. I mean, he, you know, he, he's the right kind of guest star that he, you could see what he's all about. He's interesting, but he doesn't, like, steal the show. You're not, like, it's not like uh, Q-less where... Um, Q and Vash just they're the episode and everyone else is secondary you know so like he's he's there he's driving the plot it makes sense that he's there I, I think a different character would uh, make the episode less good mm. uh, I'll go with Pulaski for once like you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna go against all those Pulaski haters out there she actually done a lot of good in this episode she she definitely sort of like stood up for data yet called him out on it a little bit of you know you know she's she's gone from being like oh you're just a a, mach a tinkerbot a machine you know something that can't think for himself and then the measure of man happened and then now she's just like oh well if the papers say he's sent in then so fine i'll stick up for his rights <laughs> <laughs> legally he's a person that's fine but no no she was she was actually good in this episode she was a driving force for data's characterization i think this is also an important data episode because he suffers through a lot of depression essentially he suffers a defeat and you know he goes a little bit teenager moodery over it and and you know as a result oh, i'm no good you know and dresses in his cure clothing and sits and hangs out you know in his room <laughs> in a dark basement just playing call of duty to four in the morning because he thinks he's not worth it but um <laughs> the seven sad operas yeah oddly <laughs> specific here fellas <laughs> <laughs> Not calling anyone out at all, but yeah, he, he has yes. to be sort of, you know, snapped into life, and Pulaski is a part of that, you know, and obviously Picard is the final blow, but with his very important speech that has been memed to death, that is equally important. Say the line. I also think she, she works better in this episode because mm. she didn't treat him great early on, and that kind of shows the growth. There is a clunker of a line, I think, where she says, you're supposed to be infallible, where she still doesn't quite get that he's not like this perfect yeah, she even mentions this, like you got beat by a machine you know you know yeah but you know yeah, outside of that like she... a, a past perception on like how computers are where it's like they're magic you yeah. know you know it's like yeah a chess program is really good at chess but it it, it couldn't you know program a website or something you know <laughs> <laughs> all right stars what about who's your hero of the episode uh guess what it's Riker and be by pretty much a country mile because like by this point, um, Jonathan Frakes has completely grown into the role, and it's just Jonathan Frakes when he's on all cylinders, and when you give him time to just stretch out and luxuriate and have fun, <laughs> uh, there is he has so and he much can stretch quite far. <laughs> he has so much screen presence and so charisma. Every time he's on that bridge of the Hathaway, he is challenged, he is undergunned, undermanned, he hasn't got anything to his name, he's having the time of his life. He loves it. He's at, he, guess what? Like, that sells you on why you should care about Riker. More than, like, you know, anything about womanizing or, like, perfectionism, it's that he enjoys a challenge, and that's a really relatable and fun thing to see. And I feel like especially like for him this is an important episode like toward his growth as a character as well because it's like it's all about 
seeing his plot and how that's going to shift and grow and change, you know, just like seasons. What a horrible thing to say to a man. And <laughs> but you consider this episode in comparison to um, Best of Both Worlds, like. You know, oh, I think that the combat is a minor part of a starship, uh, starship captain's life, and then you flash forward to Best of Both Worlds, where his metal is what determines whether or not the Federation lives or dies. Um, this is kind of a long form, really important record. Um, and I just really enjoy Frank's like dynamic with everyone. Like, guess what? Like, Riker and Picard may not have like the closest dynamic of all the first officers. I think that might be reserved for possibly. I mean, obviously Kirk and Spock, or even like um, Kira and and uh, Cisco, but just like th the moments here where Picard has that quiet confidence in him, and then Riker justifies it every time. I just adore it. Like it's Jonathan Frakes. And, so, and do you want to know Jonathan Frakes? Actually, I was I was um, listening to his uh, interview on Gates McFadden's podcast, um, Investigates, mm. and in you, if you've ever listened to his early, you know, ever know about his early life, his early acting life. He was actually an understudy for uh, Christopher Reeve, and nothing oh, wow. nothing shows that yeah, more yeah. here than this episode. Like you can definitely see the Superman. Go with that Superman. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that he's Superman got he's got the cleft chin. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There could have been different, but he was definitely in those areas. And then Christopher Reeve, obviously, he said he said like Christopher Reeve just went. He had Superman, and that was it. He was he was astronomic, but early days, those two were you know those two were doing things together and definitely working you in, really in could you service. could have had christopher reeve Riker, i think and it would have played yeah. pretty similarly mm. yeah. all right you guys took the easy ones you basic male images <laughs> but i'm gonna take another easy one it's wharf um mm. every every in every scene he's got at least one great line i've wagered heavily in the ship's pool that you would take him past the sixth plateau and if i don't i will be irritated he says <laughs> Talking early on about the Zakdorn, so no one's willing to test that perception in combat. Exactly. Then the reputation means nothing. You see, like, his love for challenge, his love for combat. When, where do I get the cable from? He just rips optical cable out from the ceiling. He's like, here, take this. And then, do you have the, do you have the music ready, Idol, for our... Oh, wait, no. Hang on. The, the jazz... Professionalism remix. on this man. Hang on, hang I, on. I, I, I sent it to him this morning. You did, yep. Give me a second. <laughs> How many DMs is he ignored now? Is that no, no, DMs I've got it. I've literally got it right here. Hang on. Right, go on. And the reason why he's now being inducted into the Trek Trek Hall of Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a good point. Uh, all right. <laughs> Worst war, line read of Guile. It is he's he's the one that drives this episode. You know he's the right hand man for Riker. He hits all his marks. This episode being awesome doesn't hurt. So uh, I hereby this is a unilateral decision, but I'm sure Sars will <laughs> agree. Guess this what? This is a whole. <laughs> Go ahead. Guess what? Wolf in Star in Star Trek TNG peak performance. Now that's a Star Trek. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, he he hits all the marks for me, and cling on just the line read of of guile, and then you know Riker the shitting grin. Picard's like, "What was that?" And Riker turns himself on the call, like he joins the Zoom call on his own. He goes, "That was cling on guile." He's so proud of Worf <laughs> as his right hand man. So uh, this is really a great. Uh, he See. was a great. Like you almost don't miss miss Tasha in this episode. I know it's been a while since she was on the show, but it's like he he can handle everything they throw yeah. at him, he, and he really does. I like so. to think that as soon as he says "gal," you just hear the <laughs> you just get like a little bit, da -da -da, and it cuts to another scene. But it's like, oh yeah, this is a badass. This is some shaft stuff going on here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think it is high time we went over to our best and worst moments. So, uh, Overtired, what were your best and worst moments of this episode? Um, well, I think I'll take the easy best moment, uh, Picard telling Data that it's possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. Um, I think that's a message you don't hear a lot in media. You hear it a lot in memes now, but it was different in 91 or whenever this came out. 90, 1990. Uh, 88. Oh. 88. Yeah. Oh, all right. Even better. Um, uh, worst moment, I think it's got to be just the, either uh, that Troy gets outshined in counseling. <laughs> um, 
or uh, just uh, the Ferengi's poor IT security. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, like we said, like it that works with the Ferengi, and mm. when they're still like quasi villainous at this point. <laughs> so, stars. Hmm. Let's see. I have a bevy of choices. You know, I'm going to go with my worst just because there are so much fewer, fewer of them. If I don't jump on it straight away, I'm going to regret it. Um, it's the slightly gormless look on Armin Shimmerman and the other Fringy actors' face when they come on the, <laughs> the, the, the Zoom call of doom where they're just like... And it's like, it would be one thing if it's meant to communicate their general misunderstanding of the situation because they don't get what's going on, because that's the point. But like, it legitimately feels like we're, we're caught on their footage and they haven't been given their line read yet. No, like it's so funny. for the director to hit that board. It's even funnier than that because later on they have another scene and it's a different camera angle and they both just kind of go like... They both kind of turn to the camera like... Ah. And it's like, I'm not necessarily asking that you give me that... Like, of like season one <laughs> Ferengi, but I'm asking for something else that's not the look that I have on my face when I have to watch TNG Season 1. Um, so that's my worst moment. My best moment... There's so much of it. Um, just one moment. Just one moment. <laughs> yeah, um, you can take two. There are a billion in this episode. So. Okay, I think it probably would have to be when they first do the um, the sensor trick and they get fooled with the Roman uh, Bird of Prey. And um, Korami oh. is just like giggling no, like much. a schoolgirl behind <laughs> like the the tactical uh, tactical banister of doom um, <laughs> the, for the fine wooden veneer. Tactical banister. Um, and well, it it's seems like, like he realizes the trick before anyone else does. Yeah, like, I think he's, he's a master trick strategist, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. and. Even though Picard just got his like pants yanked down around his ankles, he's not angry. He's just like, nah. He's, he's the best. excited, isn't if, he? he w if he wasn't able to do that, he shouldn't be my first officer. Yeah. Um, and the second would have to. I guess I'm going to take another easy one. It's um, I busted because it, it's just up. so. It's a. Yeah. It's such a TOS episode ending of everyone around the thing laughing and having a good time. Um. But guess what? They earned that moment, and it's a genuinely smart solution to the problem. And guess what? It may be a redux TOS Spock Bones moment, but Data earned it, and he deserves it. Let him have his victory. It's cute. I love it. Also, it ties into Exhibit C, uh, the camaraderie. Like, they all show up for his match, except yeah. for Picard, because he's got to run the ship. But it's like, yeah, yeah, they all show up and root him on, so it's fun. Uh... I'll go for. I think my best moment is it is list. It's near busting them up, but it's just before that. It is literally, you know, you've seen Riker play Stratagamer against Kolrami, and you know, it's a lot of frustration, a lot of stuff on the other side. Data's first match, a lot of frustration, a lot of confusion, and then there's the third match, and then there's Kolrami sweating away, tweaking his fingers, and then Data just giving that <laughs> smug grin, just going. Mm -hmm. I don't even have to look at what I'm doing. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. Yeah, I don't even have to. You're gonna enjoy it. your eyes. I am just your, gonna. And he is so smug. Slow death. That is a little evolution of data right there. My worst moment is probably still gonna be the Ferengi entering in the nth hour to add just the. I'm just. I'm just literally picturing the writers' room just going like, ah, we need some threat in this episode. What about the Ferengi? Okay, that'll do. Um, I, I'm still a little bit like feel feeling like they're a little bit of an. Of sorry, go on. We need to fill ten Earth minutes of time to get this episode. <laughs> yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I told you the guests are always the funniest. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's so good. Um, yeah, I just felt like that was a bit. That was that. That's the little bit of a artificial threat where I felt like they could have done a lot more with the drama of the the war games itself. But that's just me. Hey. Um, Auto. All right, I'll take two best moments. Uh since one of them kind of overlaps. First of all, excellent set design on the Hathaway. Like, you know they had fun making it look damaged and destroyed. And then the fact that they interact with the set, like pulling cable down and, and the weird... Yanking the giant hatch off of the uh, warp core, yeah. Yeah, with like the rebar. And they even give you a shot from inside the warp core, which I think is the only time we ever see that in Star Trek. So a lot of fun there. 
the other best is just Sirna Kulrami in general. Uh, there's been probably a thousand minor character guest appearances across Star Trek. This guy, I don't even have to think about it. Top five. So good. And not only is he hilariously humorous and everything, but he's a legitimate, you believe that he's like a great strategist. He figures out uh, the Hathaway's attack before Picard does. You know, he beats beats them in stratagema without breaking a sweat. You know, he's a very, he talks about the tactical losses and retreat and like, you know, he knows his stuff, but he's also a giant clown, which makes him, <laughs> defangs him. Looks like a big Teletubby, we say. We were saying while we were watching it, it really does. Um, so just great, great usage. Like, I'm kind of sad he only had one more role. If he was the Jeffrey Coombs and they put on different makeup every week, I would tune in absolutely. Worst part was the 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 women in this one. The women. Uh, ah, le- okay. No women. <laughs> Lieutenant Nagel. Uh, bet you didn't know her name. Who's like, where am I going to get the optical cable? What about the view screen? She doesn't really know what's going on. They don't give her much. Although her expressions are kind of funny. And then Troy. A loss can be disheartening. And she's trying these like totally basic psychiatric things. It's like, yeah, you she know also doing talk- this like... You know, oh, like with her hand, she's like, well, you, a lost him. It's like you're going through like your psychological textbook. Like, what are you doing here? You, it's like she doesn't realize who she's talking to. And it's like, you only have one, Tawny Madison, she only has one job on this ship. And oh, she man. can't do it in this episode. So there's definitely been worse Troy episodes. Like, at least she does reach out to Data when she senses that, you know, he's in a, having a tough time. But she's so bad at it. So. Well, her scene in the then, briefing room with him is much better. For her character and she doesn't, I didn't do it a that, ton yeah. but it is right bad. but why is she there for the tactical strategy briefing when she's the counselor like that doesn't because there are no other members of the principal cast left to be yeah. there yeah so <laughs> you know not her worst but certainly not great so there you go okay uh, I did have other one other just thing to note it's like they all like say, "Oh, Karami, he's so arrogant. What an asshole!" It's like, have you guys seen yourself in season one? Like, you are <laughs> all the most arrogant people. And also, he's right when you look at it. It's okay, well, yeah. so they right. they come up with the war games thing, and if he hadn't gone through the war games and the idea of a better tactical readiness for the for Starfleet, how much more fucked would they have been in Best of Both Worlds? If you think about right. it in universe, do right. Okay, it is now time to go on to our... I can show you my rating code. Shiller rating 3-5. Associational rating norm minus 3. That's much too low a rating. Much too low a rating. Seeing an unsatisfactory rating on a member of my crew. Stars, what is our rating criteria for this episode, please? Gentlemen, may you be idle or automated or overtired. How many moments of circumstantially inappropriate joviality <laughs> yeah. out of ten would you like to give this episode? Oh. Um. Also, go on. You start us this week. All right. Yeah, I already spoiled it. I'm giving it a 9.9. And this actually has smarter scripts than a lot of tens, I think, out there. From beginning to end, it's like it's over a nine in almost every scene. And there's one or two dips with the Ferengi or you know, Troy being kind of useless. But wall-to-wall, it is so solid. And the reason why I give it 9.9, two reasons. <clears throat> One, we'll shout out Jeopardy winner Jared Watson, who says, think long, think wrong. I had to think about this one. Like, is it really a 10? Well, if you got to think about it, it's not. Number mm-hmm. two, it doesn't have this great emotional climax, like um, uh, the inner light. When Picard's talking to his dying wife, I lose it every time. In Timeless, you know, when, when Harry, their ship's about to explode, he hits the panel and he saves Voyager at the last second. What a great emotional climax. This doesn't have that. So I do think about this episode from time to time, but not, you know, I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm such a nerd. Sometimes I walk down the street and I'll just stop and be like, damn, I love that episode. You know, out of nowhere. <laughs> this, this doesn't creep into my consciousness quite like the other ones. So I'm going to get, but it's so strong. 9.9 uh, circumstan- moments of wow. circumstantially inappropriate joviality out of 10. Uh, Overside. Uh, I would say just as an episode of TV, 10 out of 10. As an episode of Star Trek, I'd say like a 9 out of 10. Um, Because it does, um, you know, it does lack um, like some stakes, but it's thoroughly enjoyable. And I don't see ever 
why you would skip it if you were rewatching through. And, you know, it's definitely a, a high watermark in the early seasons. So, I would, so, nine out of so 10. you'd give it nine what out of 10? <laughs> nine uh, inappropriate moments of joviality. <laughs> Good enough. Close enough. I'll take it. Uh, stars. Guess what? I, I spoiled it also at the top of the hour, and guess what? It's, my answer is still remains the same. It is 10 moments of circumstantially inappropriate joviality out of 10. Every time I watch this episode, I just come away with a big smile and a gosh, I love Star Trek. I get a smile on my face. I just. It has all the right vibes. The characters all get like their little moment to shine. There's a bad performance going on. Like. This is the first time I've even noticed the Ferengi doing their weird little like things because they don't really matter. They really don't matter. <laughs> it's like complaining that, like, oh, I'm watching Succession and one of the couches has like a stain on it. Who gives a shit? I'm not here for that. I'm here for the characters. And the character work here was sublime. This 10 out. A 10 uh, what? Sorry. No, I yeah, really so. said, but yeah, I'll yeah, so, <laughs> so I will. I'll give this 8.5. Five moments of circumstantial inappropriate joviality. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I, you say like eight point five is like a fucking diss. Like it's still an incredibly good episode. Like I really enjoyed it. Yes. I I've, I've made my statement known. So what what my weak points were for the episode, and that was purely like the ending parts, but uh, and the most. But as for like what you were saying about this being a pilot episode, and what you know we're saying, the introduction of the characters, or like getting good moments out of every character this makes wesley a really good character this episode like he does his whole like i'm he's just great. an ensign i'm coming over to beams i uh, know actually no, i'm coming to beam over the freaking cloaking device and putting it on the on the on the freaking cling on on the, on the enterprise you know this is <laughs> this is this is my moment of being extra shifty but it, it, it was very good and he said you told me to use my improvisation like it gives a good moment for every single character in this cast like everyone gets a good moment no one has even Cole Rami, he's played up as being a bit of a dick, but at the end of it, like you don't feel like he is an antagonist this episode. He's just kind of doing his job, and he is, you know, he's very eccentric. But yeah, well, and I, like with uh, the the sensor trick that Riker pulls, like he's been down on Riker the whole time, and he's the first to be like, "Oh, this is great," you know. Yeah. So he's not yeah. just I'm an asshole and I hate that guy for no reason. No, he's just yeah. you know. You can have the most beautiful meal in the world. All the ingredients work really well together. It's a very savory dish. If you don't have a dash of spice in there, mm. it's not going to be a great dish. And, you know, sometimes we tag TNG because it's like, oh, everyone's perfect in their jobs. He's the little bit of spice. He gets, he mixes things mm. up. They literally insult each other while they're still in the room, like walking away, just loud enough so that they can hear each other. It's really good stuff, so... Well, on that, this brings this episode to a triumphant 9.4 average. Definitely one of the top oh, episodes by the way, of all time. On behalf of Dan Javin, I'm rating this a 9.5. I think that's what he would give it. So. <laughs> well, I'll wait to hear it from him before I put it in the spreadsheet. Yeah, well. I have some last fun facts that we haven't talked about so far. You guys who know, you guys all know who played uh, Braktor, the Frangy Captain, don't you? You gotta say it. Ar Armin Schimmer. There we go. Thank you. Uh, overtime. Andrew Ryan the line overtime. <laughs> yes. Armin <laughs> Schimmerman was indeed playing his second role in TNG as another Frengi uh, as Braktor. Uh, no, actually, no, third one. Sorry, because he was the uh, Betazoidian head in a box. And I remember him saying, actually, he was really unhappy with that characterization. Because when they when they went for Quark and all the DS9 stuff, they went back and watched TNG Ferengi, and he's like, "This is terrible. We're not going to do this for DS9." So I don't think he loved, mm. you know, how how one note they were. The other thing is, this also marks Glenn. Uh, sorry, Glenn. More showers. More shower. More shower. Uh, first appearance in Star Trek for those uh, people who recognize him as Aaron Pierce in the hit series Twenty Four. And in so many other things, he plays a general in pretty much any yeah. film and anything else out there. Uh, this is a small pop quiz for you guys. You're not going to get the answers for this because he plays quite a few unknown characters. But can you guys tell me what other appearances he has in Star Trek, if you know them? You will have seen his face another five times. No, four other oh. four other times. Is he in Voyager? He is. Uh, yes. I can sort of see there's some prosthetics on his face, but mm -hmm. I can't name any characters. No, he he played Orton in Starship Mine. 
So he oh, was one. Orton, yeah. Yeah, he played a navigator yeah. in Generations. So he was in the films. He was, I think, sitting beside Tuvok. Uh, yeah. uh, he played the Mokra Order Guard in the episode. I think it was a Voyager episode, Resistance. And he was in Enterprise in North Star as McReady. You know, he's one of the uh, the people in the town there. But yeah, he is, he is very much a, a part of Oh, one that's of the... right. Wasn't he like the sheriff or something? Something like that, yeah. With a name yeah. like McCready, most likely, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's one of those faces. You see him in TV all the time. But you're like, yeah, here he is making his first debut in TNG as a very young... By the way, um, we've I think we've done a couple... Great... We did at least one Gregory Itson episode already in mm. Dax. More Shower and Itson play opposing characters in 24 and i promise you it's worth the price of admission these guys go head to head they incredible range incredible gravitas like it blows me away every time these guys are great in 24 so uh, if you want to watch them i think specifically season five is where they butt heads it's really good stuff 24 is a great series um but anyway thank you everyone for coming thank you over time thank you uh for joining us this week if you're on stream stick about we're about to watch the magnificent ferengi if you're watching us on youtube check us out in a couple of weeks we'll be back soon please check out our other channel including all our charity show stuff uh which has just been published and everything like that but we will see you soon see you later have a wonderful time and please don't spend too much time playing Stratagamer. you'll go blind Ta-ra!